Hello and welcome to this video lecture on Book 5 of Plato's Republic. As we'll see, the centerpiece of this book is the um, three waves that Socrates introduces to characterize the just city and to tell us how the city is going to be possible. And as, as we'll see, that's a theme that continually recurs in this book, Book 5, that theme of possibility. Um, of whether the just city is possible and how, in fact, it's possible. And the reforms that the three waves of reform that Socrates introduces in this chapter are the things that are supposed to make um, the just city possible, to make it a realistic idea, um, as opposed to a kind of uh, um, a kind of thought project. So we'll take a close look at this and we'll see there's some other um, interesting things that happen here as well when Socrates talks about the relation between the city and the citizens and characterizes that with some interesting metaphors. Okay, so what happens at the beginning of book five, a restage is something that we've seen a couple of times happening in the book. We saw it happening right at the beginning where Polemicus is involved in arresting Socrates and bringing him back to his house so we can have a discussion about justice. And here at the beginning of chapter five, we see the same thing happening again. And, uh, and again, this is a, a sort of sign that we're that we're repeating um, the incident. Polemicus is involved again. Polemicus touches somebody's cloak. Uh, and again, there's a there's a demand for Socrates to explain himself. We've seen often the word apologia occurs in this context, uh, which is the, the kind of trial defense, a person's trial def defense of themselves before a, a sort of jury of their peers. And so that scene um, and Socrates' arrest is again sort of fictionally staged um, at the beginning of this chapter. Um, and here it's in, in relation to something that he mentioned in an offhand way in book four, and it wasn't pursued because other things were sort of on the table and other things were under discussion. But here it, it comes up because the um, the the others, Adimasus, Glaucon, and Polemicus, decide that they they can't allow Socrates to go any further without explaining himself. So 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 again we see. And this this whole sort of setup, this fictional setup of Socrates' arrest and rearrest, um, and again, one of the things it does is it foregrounds the theme of power that we've seen is central to the argument of the book itself, um, and and we're going to get into that paradox more fully in the next couple of chapters. The fact that as Socrates has told us. Um, and is, is going to tell us at, at the end of this chapter um, about rulers. Um, and, and we're going to hear that um, rulers have to be of a certain have to be of a certain kind and rulers have to be trained as philosophers um, in, in order to rule. But of course, philosophers have no interest in ruling, so they have to be forced uh, to rule. So this question of force is actually central to the, the argument um, of the book and in fact central to the to the arrangement of the just city. And so we, we see right at the beginning that um, that process is kind of staged again. Now, here's what Socrates says before um, he introduces the first wave, and we'll we'll talk about that in in a second. And he talks about presenting arguments at a time when one is in doubt and seeking as being both a sort of frightening and slippery thing. He's sort of he's making out that he's unsure of himself, that that he's not quite sure where this is leading. He doesn't quite trust his ability to sort of speak um, in a way that really articulates the issue at, at hand. And he says, it's not because I'm afraid of being laughed at, that's childish, but because I'm afraid that in slipping from the truth where one least ought to slip, I'll not only fall myself, um, but drag my friends down with me. So he's saying, I'm, I'm not afraid of people making fun of me. Um, I'm afraid of sort of slipping from the truth 
as though that's the thing that sort of causes, as though that's the thing that causes laughter. Um, that's going to be an important theme in this book, as we'll see when we when we look at the first wave, um, and the fact that in Socrates' time, when Socrates was a citizen of, of Athens, there were a, a number of factions who um, were looking to and tried to subject the philosopher and Socrates to a kind of ridicule. Um, and there are, um, you know, there are examples of this in plays where Socrates is depicted as a kind of foolish, bumbling person. Um, and this kind of the curious habits of the philosopher, um, sort of gazing at the stars and sort of looking um, into the earth and sort of trying to figure out what things are made of. And these are strange obsessions to have. So this is this sort of idea of being laughed at. We'll see that em emerge in the first wave, and we'll we'll see in relation to that. Um, there's a kind of there's a kind of humor that, that emerges, I think, in this chapter that is different to this kind of this kind of fear of being laughed at, a fear of being made fun of. Um, and it's almost as, as though in the chapter we we kind of reach this higher level of, of humor, this kind of humor of how um, of how things look when you sort of try and, and rationally plan out. Um, you know, practical events from a theoretical perspective, right? There's a kind of, it's almost like there's a kind of, there's a greater humor in philosophy um, that sort of, that makes this sort of, this laughing at, this sort of ridicule, um, makes it look sort of second rate and cheap. Anyway, we'll make that argument in the, in the course of this chapter and we'll see if there's um, any merit to that, but certainly, um, this is Socrates' fear, apparently, that he's going to slip from the truth. OK, as I said, we, we're going to meet three. Um, we're going to encounter three big waves. And these three big waves are the three big reforms that Socrates proposes for the just city um, to make it a real possibility, sort of reforms um, in how the guardians and everybody's lives are going to be arranged. Um, and these these things will sort of institute the just city within the populace. All right, so the first wave is involves the, um, the sort of common activities among men and women. Men and women are to practice all functions and activities together. Now, this discussion that takes place um, in the midst of this, in the midst of, of this argument, and Socrates raises the, the the possibility that when people see this in practice, um, people are going to say that it's ridiculous, and people are going to laugh at this. Now, I've, we have to sort of imagine ourselves in the in the sort of minds and the world of people 2,500 years ago. Um, and Socrates is proposing this idea that women exercise naked with with men, um, and and that they you know they sort of take part in in all activities and functions, including exercise in the gymnasium together. Um, and Glaucon's response that would look ridiculous in the present state of things. And Socrates says, well, I said since we've started to speak again, we mustn't be afraid of all the jokes of whatever kind the wits might make if such a change took place in gymnastic and music, and not least in the bearing of arms and the riding of horses. This is really fascinating because we're partly dealing here with a kind of um, with a sort of ingrained prejudice, which was certainly sort of part of societies 2,500 years ago. Um, whether the mere idea of, of men and women sort of exercising together um, just seems ridiculous. Men and women are sort of separate entities confined to separate spheres of life. Women are in the domestic realm. Men are, have a role in the public realm. For them to be mixing and doing activities together doesn't make any sense, right? For Socrates, this is simply a, a case where the where the sort of rational argument that 
that there are no relevant differences between men and women that necessitate them practicing different activities um, simply wins the, the day, right? If you believe that argument that there are no sort of significant differences that stop men and women doing the same exercises, then they, why not have them exercise together? There's no reason not to allow that. Now, of course, today, for us, we used to go to the gym, we used to working out, men and women are working out together. This is not a problem, right? It, it looks like a mere prejudice of, of, of the sort of society of the time of the ancient Greeks. And partly it, it is that. Um, and partly it took a long time for these things to sort of work themselves out in history. But there's a moment of, I think, a moment that should sort of disturb us a little bit here um, in that he mentions the bearing of arms and the riding of horses. And in fact, the truth is, um, even today, we are still having vigorous debates about, about some of these issues of, of equality and, and common functions, in the, because there are still these arguments about um, what role women should play in the military, should, be on the should they be on the front line, should they be bearing arms. And there are still, um, you know, institutions pushing different um, different lines in, in that debate. So it's not like the debate has disappeared. Sure, the line has sort of moved um, towards many more functions that are considered um, ones that men and women do together. But we still have arguments today, say in a military context about what roles are appropriate for women. And it's it's quite amazing, I think, that, that writing 2,500 years ago, Plato is, presenting us with this argument of, of equality that even goes beyond the kind of e equality that that we've managed to um, we've managed to set up 2500 years later right that that even there we, that there are still some reservations and hesitations in relation to the military military for example and Plato has Socrates here arguing for equality of all practices and functions. So to make this argument stick, Socrates once again appeals to nature, and we've seen that's a big part of the argument, the idea that we're good by nature and that we, we, we want to sort of do good by nature, right? Here it's about the, the sort of nature of, of men and women, and Socrates says, yes, the nature of men and women is different, but those differences are irrelevant for, for fulling, fulfilling the functions of ruling guarding and producing, right? And again, we've seen those distinctions break down over the years. We've seen it in our own time. Um, women have been leaders in different um, different parts of the world as prime ministers, um, in the military, um, and at the sort of highest echelons of science um, and other areas of sort of production. So, so that seems, it seems common nature to us. Of course, it wasn't common nature 2,500 years ago, and I think I think we ought to be uh, um, impressed to an extent that Socrates can sort of bring forth this argument about equality, which was purely theoretical at, at the time and not really based on, on anything about Socrates' society, which was very sort of patriarchal, in which gender roles were sort of rigidly divided. Um, so this is just a, a, a case where he he comes to these conclusions just by the power of reason and thought. So we have Socrates declaring gender almost irrelevant as a principle of social organization. And it, it's, almost, it's almost irrelevant because Socrates tells us uh, women are, are free to make up, to make up, um, to be part of the the ruling class, the warrior class, and the producer class. Women will be in all three categories. Um, but he goes on to say that women would will be the weaker cat, the weaker sort of participants in each category, weaker than men in each case. So there will be women who are fit to go into the the ruling class, but they will be weaker than the male rulers. There will be women fit to go into the warrior class, but they will be weaker than the male warriors. And women in the producer class, but they will be weaker than the male producers. So it's 
it, it acknowledges this idea of equality in all classes, which, which again was very foreign to Athenian society of, of the time um, and indeed societies for quite a long time thereafter. But it also sort of it pulls that back a little bit and says, but nonetheless, women will be the weaker sex um, in all of, of those categories. Um, so maybe we can give two cheers for Socrates for um, sort of recognizing these ideals of equality a long, long time before they became social realities. OK, now the second wave is the one that he was called back on by. Um, Adimatus and others at the start of this chapter and call to explain himself. Um, and this is this is the one where we really get into some um, funky arguments about how to make this possible. Um, so it, it's officially the sort of community, or we can call it the communism of women and children. Um, and the, the clearest way of understanding what it means is that for the guardians, um, for the for the auxiliaries and the rulers, family is abolished, that family ceases to exist as a kind of unit of, of social organization. Uh, women belong to men in common and their children in turn will be in common um, and parents will not know their offspring, nor child is a parent. Um, so this is a sort of radical change in the social org organization of those two classes. And we sort of got a sense of, of that at the end of the third chapter where, where we were told they're going to live in common. Um, now we're sort of realizing the implications of that, that that means there will be no sort of family structure. Um, all of the guardians together will sort of look after all of the um, all of the children that are sort of going to be future guardians. Um, now, What's interesting here is that Socrates says as to whether it's beneficial, I don't suppose it, it would be disputed, it would be the greatest good, but I suppose that there would arise a great deal of dispute as to whether they are possible, right? So Socrates is putting the emphasis on whether, whether it's possible, whether it's plausible, um, whether it makes sense, not whether it would be the greatest good. He's quite persuaded of that. What he's not persuaded of is its is its possibility. How could we do this, right? Um, and so that's that's sort of where the focus is. Okay, and that focus I think shifts the question to the relationship between these kind of ideals um, and this sort of ideal formulation of of the perfect society that Socrates. Um, is, is giving us and the, the sort of human nature, the sort of human materials that are going to go into that, um, that are going to go into that makeup. And we're going to see here, we've been talking, Socrates has been talking about the role of nature and we've been sort of seeing that and following that, that, that the, the sort of people will be distinguished into different classes according to their nature. Um, we've seen him talking about the, the nature of men and women. We've seen him have a very sort of optimistic view of, of human nature insofar as he criticizes the sort of the, the myth of Gyges ring um, and talks about this this kind of um, character and possibility of, of acting on the basis of good um, and acting according to our long-term interests and principles. Now we're going to see those two, the, the idea of nature um, and this ideal city kind of come apart and separate almost, right? So it's as it's as though it's it's as though we'll see a kind of a different idea of nature that makes this argument problematic. Socrates doesn't state this, but I think we can see it sort of emerging in in the argument if we listen closely. Um, but at any rate. This sort of second wave is going to bring a number of problematic assumptions, and we have to think carefully about how we deal with these assumptions, how we sort of treat them, what we think more properly, what we think the book is doing in presenting these possibilities to us and presenting them to us in the way that it does. So. One troublesome thing to, ar to arise immediately from this idea of the abolition of family um, is that suddenly we, we get into this discussion of 
eugenics. Because um, suddenly it becomes apparent that um, intercourse has to be regulated in some way if the city is to kind of keep its proportions um, and if it's to kind of um, keep its current sort of level of perfection. Right? So the idea of eugenics has a very ugly history in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century, um, not just associations with Nazism, but even in the United States, there was a strong eugenics movement um, that sort of was obsessed with the idea of a decline of the natural of the national stock, um, more people sort of immigrating to the country who weren't as sort of didn't have as good stock, weren't as well born as the people already here. Those are the kind of um, the kind of ideas that sort of give rise to an idea of eugenics, um, and it means arranging arranging births, arranging population um, in such a way as to as to permit the best to flourish or to permit the flourishing of the best. Um, and now listen carefully now when he when Socrates comes to describe this um, and he describes this idea of sort of regulating in intercourse through this eugenics principle and notice how we end up here with a view of nature um, that's very different from the kind of idea of nature that we've been talking about so far in the sense of a sort of growth and realization. Here it becomes almost animal-like. Here it becomes almost as though, um, you know, nature is to be sort of manipulated as, as stocks and are uh, to be manipulated. And remember the, you know, we had this metaphor in the first book with Thrasymachus, who sort of compared society to a shepherd and sheep. Now, the more that we sort of come towards these, these sort of ideas of eugenics, the more we seem to be in the realm of that type of thinking where it's a sort of manipulative relation between shepherd and flock. Listen to what Socrates says here. On the basis of what has been agreed, I said, there is a need for the best men to have intercourse as often as possible with the best women and the reverse for the most ordinary men and the most ordinary women. And the offspring of the former must be reared, but not that of the others, if the flock is going to be of the most eminent quality. And all this must come to pass without being noticed by anyone except the rulers themselves. If the guardians heard, is to be free as possible from faction. So we have a number of things here. We, we have the kind of elitism of the ordinary and the, the great, which we've seen before and, and we'll see again, that sort of residual, um, not really residual, but, sort, but constitutive sort of elitism um, that's, that we're gonna see as we go forward as, as well. We have this reference to, to the flock and its eminent quality, which again suggests a kind of um, manipulative and strategic relation to the people, um, which doesn't seem to be the kind of society that, that Socrates was setting out to create. And then, of course, we have the, 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 the next implication that, of course, this must all be done in secret. Um, so some shocking things are, are going on here. Um, and it, it seems like we've, it seems like something's happened to, to sort of blow the, the argument off course. It seems to be heading in a strange direction. Now, I mentioned previously that Socrates talked about how he's not really afraid of being laughed at. Um, he's not afraid of being laughed at, he says, what he's afraid of falling short of the truth. Okay? Um, and he says, What's, what, I, what, I, what I really want to do is, what I want to make sure is, is to make sure that I stay with the rational and that everything I say is sort of rationally um, proved and certified. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to sort of, um, I, I don't care if I uh, I'm not afraid of looking ridiculous, right? So here we have a kind of um, a number of cases where Socrates, in defense of this idea of, of the second wave, of the communism of women and children, says things which um, it's really hard to take seriously. 
Right, so on page 138, we, we hear that the rulers will have to use a throng of lies and deceptions for the benefit of, of the ruled. And again, we've been hearing about how truth is so important to Socrates, um, this idea of truth and sticking to the truth. And yet the rational city um, is going to have this, this problem of lies and deceptions. And then he says, so then certain festivals and sacrifices must be established by law at which we will bring the brides and bridegroom together. So try and imagine this, the sort of the people in charge of breeding um, are going to arrange festivals and then they're going to sort of hook up certain brides and bridegrooms who have been sort of scheduled to, to breed. They're going to introduce, they're going to sort of have them meet. So they're going to have them um, converse together and hooked to, as as they do with, you know, this happens with stock, uh, livestock, right? People bring animals together to, um, to, to have them reproduce, to have them procreate, to, um, to sort of keep up the stock. And this is what's being described here. And this is what's being described in, in the perfect city with guardians who are dedicated to reason. Um, and the, the perfect city is going to be run according to reason and according to the long-term good of the city. And finally, we, we hear that, so I think they will take the offspring of the good and bring them into the pen to certain nurses and those of the worst and any others born deformed, they will hide away in an unspeakly and unseemly place. Now, of course, in a society without medicine, as the ancient Greek society was, um, you know, if you can't save babies, you leave them to die or to expire on the hillside. Um, and that, that's that's not as cruel as, as it seems to us um, when medicine, when you you have no medicine, so you can't save a sickly child, um, even if you wanted to. Um, and the sort of burden it places on a family is probably going to ruin um, the family in many respects. But even so, this idea that that if, if a sort of accident happens, a birth happens that wasn't sort of planned, um, that you bring it to be destroyed, um, that's a, a kind of strange prescription to have for a perfect society. Or does it maybe suggest that a perfect society um, is, is, is one that, that looks on the ground like the most hideously evil place? Um, and why does that seem to be the case? Is there a type of, is there a type of humor um, that Socrates is sort of or maybe even that the book is suggesting to us, is there a type of humor that is at stake um, in this perfectly rational society and how it shows itself that is different to the humor of being laughed at, um, where the humor of being laughed at is because uh, we say something unknowingly, um, not realizing that it's ridiculous. But here, what about if, if it takes a, an entirely rational person to come up with a perfectly rational society and that itself sounds ridiculous and everybody's in on the joke except the people that take it seriously right so it could be that we're it could be that we're, we're looking in a kind of shift in in the humor here and we're looking in a shift at what we're laughing at and who we're really laughing at at um, who is in, in on the joke here is this is it in fact intended as, as a joke and if it's not why does everything look so contrary um, to the to the sort of truth governed perfect city that that we were sort of promised in the beginning okay now there's a really important uh, metaphor that comes up here in this chapter um, and it recalls this idea of the body politic what's often called and as a metaphor it's often represented in this image which is very famous as the cover of Thomas Hobbes Leviathan um, and, and it shows the sovereign whose body is made up of all of the citizens so all of the citizens are the kind of body politic the body of the state and Socrates uses this metaphor as follows let's sort of Let's read it through because it's kind of important. Have we any greater evil for a city than what splits it and makes it many instead of one, or a greater good than what binds it together and makes it one? No, we don't. Doesn't the community of pleasure and pain bind it together when to the greatest extent possible 
all the citizens alike rejoice and are pained at the same comings into beings and perishings. That's entirely certain, he said, but the privacy of such things dissolves it when some are overwhelmed and some are ov others overjoyed by the same things happening to the city and those within the city. Of course, doesn't that happen when they utter such phrases as my own and not my own at the same time in the city? and with similarly with respect to somebody else's. Is then that city in which we most say my own and not my own about the same thing in the same way the best governed city by far? Now we've been through this with the guardians and we've seen how their lives are to be arranged where everything is, is to be in common. And we've just seen the argument about the abolition of the family where even um, children are, are to be in common, there are no separate families, intercourse is arranged in order to procreate, um, and that the children are sort of taken and raised collectively, collectively by the guardians, none of them know whose children are whose, right? And that's entirely in keeping with the public spirited nature um, of the guardians' existence, right? They're not permitted a private existence. In that way, their lives are sort of identical with the well-being of the city as, as a whole. And th they don't have any sort of private lives which sort of go against that and, and contradict that focus on the well-being of, of the whole. Because they have no private existence, the guardians are able to dedicate themselves entirely to the well-being of the whole city. And Socrates says here, Is the best governed city the one that is most like a single human being? Note here, and this is the this is the real force of the of the metaphor about the body politic, right? That the city itself is really like a single person. So when one of us wounds a finger, the entire community is wounded. The entire community is 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 afflicted. Um, everybody is is hurt at the same thing, right? Now, what's really central here is, is for us to remember what happened uh, when we made that switch in book three and Socrates said, let's look at the city as a whole instead of looking at the individual person, right? Now, part of what we're seeing here is that the focus on the whole, the focus on justice um, of the whole city, of, of, the whole, of the whole body politic, right? gives priority to this idea of, of the whole community and the whole community suffering at the same things, right? Now we've kind of learned that if that's going to be a reality, if that idea of a community sharing pleasure and pains is going to be a reality, then we, we have to eliminate, um, certainly from the, the guardian and warrior classes, we have to eliminate things um, that are going to create a sort of private incentive, a desire to say my own, that goes against that, that reality of, of a sort of common community of pleasure and pain. The only way everybody's going to feel that sort of common commonality, the community of pleasure and pain, is if nobody has any private interest which goes against the, the general interest of the well-being of the city as a whole. And Socrates says, but we further ag agree that the community of pleasure and pain is the greatest good for the city, likening the good governing of a city to a body's relation to the pain and pleasure of one of its parts. Right. So that's the relation between the whole and, and the parts that we to think of the city as a whole different functions, um, say the, the sort of, you know, the, the government is, is the head, um, the producers are the stomach, um, the warriors are the arms and, and the legs, right? So we, we think of the city as a whole as, as composing one body. So if one part is injured, the whole city is injured, right? And this means that the parts are linked together in such a way that they, what matters is, is the good of the whole, right? If it's one body, there's no sort of independent interest because the whole, the whole body lives and falls together. And what this idea of the body politics suggests is a very sort of strong togetherness, a very strong solidarity among the parts of the city, where they're, they're all sort of suffering the same things, 
they're all sort of taking pleasure in the same things um, and that creates this strong sort of sense of cohesion togetherness and solidarity um, that is stronger than if each part had its own sort of separate factional interests um, and it was trying to look after those instead of look after the good of the whole right legs can't function unless they're attached to, to the rest of, of the body right the stomach's job is not to sort of hoard all the food for itself but to digest and separate and distribute it to other parts of, of the body so it's a sort of functional idea that each part has to do its function and if it does its function the well-being of the city as a whole is maintained but each part can't try and do a function say that you know the stomach can't try to rule or the stomach can't try to sort of hoard everything and not share right everything has to do its part in order that the city as a whole thrives um, and flourishes as it's supposed to so the guardians serve the common good um, because they they don't they're not able to say my own um, to, to different things but they say my own to the same things so so the guardians are sort of united um, he can't as Plato says here they can't get their hands on anything apart from others uh, being separate in their own houses with with women and children introducing private pleasures and griefs here and griefs of things that are private right so it's it's the introduction of private pleasures and things in the guardian class that, that sort of ruins that focus on the whole and allows them to do their job so if guardians are going to sort of rule as guardians if they're to perform that functional whole sorry if they're to perform that functional role as the head of the sort of body politic guardians have to be free of private interests if they have private interests um, then that will cause faction and it will make them impossible to do that job of looking after the common good and looking after the well-being of the city as a whole now Socrates makes the point at this um, in this chapter Socrates makes the point that it's important for the guardians to get over what he calls a foolish adolescent opinion about happiness right and this sort of harks back to remember to Adimatus's charge that are the guardians going to be happy you strip them of goods you strip them of of gold and silver they eat together um, in mess halls and now we know they're not going to have family and children and any of that stuff either um, so this is where Socrates sort of this is the response about the foolish adolescent opinion about happiness and this <clears throat> this is the sort of less um, polite response to a I, I guess in, at the beginning of, of the chapter um, that Socrates is, is wants to say that there's a kind of there is a happiness of, of the guardians and it's it's the happiness of sort of of doing what they are best suited for which is ruling all of these other things that are things for which the guardians since they're suited for using their minds and thinking about the city as a whole these kind of inducements whether it be sort of wealth fame material success material goods and commodities excuse me all of those things would have no interest for the guardians because the guardians are focused on these intellectual goods um, and these intellectual ideas that they're interested in pursuing um, so this is a sort of this is a false conception of happiness remember though that we're part of this this if this works it's because we buy the idea that people are functionally different right that some people are best suited functionally for doing these things rather than these things um, of course the producers get to have some sort of degree of material wealth and happiness although it's going to be constrained by what the guardians think is appropriate um, for the well-being of society as, as a whole but certainly he thinks that the guardians are just um, their focus is, is elsewhere and they are not going to be interested um, in a vision of happiness that's just focused on wealth and material goods and fame okay so as if the first two waves weren't enough philosophy um, Socrates brings forth the third wave <clears throat> 
um, near the end of the chapter, and it basically tells us that those people who are going to rule, um, who were distinguished among the class of the guardians as the elite, those people are going to be trained as philosophers. So philosophers are going to rule. So this is the third sort of part of the good city, the third thing which explains its, its possibility. Philosophers are going to rule or rulers are going to become philosophical um, to say the same thing. Right. So those are the possibilities for um, for the for the just city. Now we're going to come on a come upon a paradox here very shortly that philosophers ought to rule because as we've as we've seen and we're going to see very shortly they're best fitted for it according to Socrates. However, they have no interest or desire to rule. Right? Why do they have no interest to rule? Because they're not interested in power. Um, they're interested in philosophy and learning um, and finding out the good and living according to the good. Um, so we're going to find this paradox that philosophers ought to rule, but they have to be kind of forced. Uh, they have to be coerced to rule. And there's that theme of coercion that we've seen throughout the book um, in dealing with philosophy, that there's a kind of coercion that is necessary to bring philosophers to the place where they're supposed to be in society. That place is um, in, place of, in the place of rule. Now, at the end of the chapter, uh, near, near the end of this chapter, book five, we encounter this distinction among forms of knowledge. Um, and we'll get more into the Plato's views of knowledge in the next chapter. But here we find a distinction between these three levels, where we have this idea of knowledge, episteme, um, in Greek, which is, Plato tells us, attuned to what is. Then below that, we have opinion or doxa, which is attuned to what is and what is not at the same time. Um, so it's a sort of mix uh, of what is and is not. And then below that, we have the level of ignorance, agnoia, which is attuned to what is not, right? So ignorance is, is what is not. So it, it, it effectively is nothing, it's nothing is known. But we can see that Plato's sort of theory of knowledge is, is is broken up according to the, the things or the beings that knowledge is aimed at. So these three things are distinguished according to what they aim at, whether they aim at what is, at being like knowledge itself, whether they aim at being and, and not being, what is and is not, like opinion. So it's kind of a mix where you're sometimes attuned to what is and sometimes you're not seeing anything or ignorance, which is wholly attuned to what? To non-being or things that are not, right? So, and of course, this is a hierarchy um, where knowledge is, is kind of the highest level. And for Plato, um, it's that level of opinion that is the kind of ordinary level, that level of opinion or doxa, as we'll see is the level of the everyday, which is gonna be distinguished from the level of knowledge, which as we'll see, and we'll sort of spell this out in the first chapter, in the next chapter, sorry, knowledge requires a, a philosophical education to be realized. Um, it's a specific kind of intellectual knowing that is different from um, other prevalent forms of knowing. Okay, so one of the things we've touched on here is is a question of interpretation. And we've talked about how we're gonna make sense of these ideas that Socrates puts forward in this chapter um, that look so outlandish and furthermore look to be um, at odds with some of the principles that have been laid down for how the just city is, is gonna look. Um, for example, we've, we've seen the, um, the idea of truthfulness, um, but we've seen Socrates say, well, for the just city, we're going to need a throng of lies and deceptions. Um, we've seen this idea of nature um, emerge and sort of nature as a principle directed towards the good. But here we see a very different conception of nature that seems to be more, more about sort of breed, stock breeding and seems more animalistic um, than it really sort of does sort of say anything about the flourishing of, of human nature. 
Um, so there are some there are some strange things happening. And it's worthwhile at this point raising the raising the question of who is speaking, right? We know that Plato is the author of these book of this book, and ultimately, ultimately the ideas here come from Plato. But of course, he doesn't say anything in his own in his own words. He writes this this book, which is um, ostensibly a work of fiction, in which Socrates is one of the characters who says things in the book. Right. So we we have a two levels here, right? We have Socrates saying things, but we have Plato, the author, also putting things into Socrates' mouth for him to say them. Now that means we can raise this question of when Socrates says things that seem very strange, um, that seem bizarre, that seem counterintuitive, that even seem contradictory, it's I think it's vital for us to, to then ask the question um, about authorship and, and about what the author is doing. And that author, of course, is Plato. Why is Plato sort of putting these ideas into Socrates' mouth? Why is he have them ex have them expound these ideas um, when they look so counterintuitive, when they look very strange and sort of contradictory in parts? Um, and here we have to decide on how we're going to interpret what's happening. Do we believe that Plato is simply faithfully telling us what Socrates thinks? Um, and of course, it might be the case that Plato thinks, well, these ideas are true, so let's just state them. Um, and, you know, who cares what people think? It may be that Plato thinks, well, these ideas are, are uh, not the greatest, maybe they're ridiculous. But let's state them anyway and see what people think. Maybe it's somewhere between those two possibilities. Um, or maybe there's something else going on. Maybe Plato is showing us something about philosophy and how it works right, in, in this matter. And he's showing us what we can take from philosophy and perhaps what we can't. Is Plato showing us the limits of what philosophy can do? Um, is he showing us that when you drive it um, past a certain position, past a certain idea, um, that, that some sort of strange and, and weird and counterintuitive things happen? Does Plato endorse the ideas in chapter five? Um, and if he doesn't, why does he present them in the way that he does? Um, if he does endorse them, why does he present them in the way that he that that he does, where they seem um, so very um, so very difficult to accept um, in parts, um, the, the sort of crazy eugenics and all of this business. So we need to interpret this. We need to figure out. We need to have a, a reading of what Plato is doing in writing this book and putting these ideas into Socrates, who is a fictional character in the book. Remember, although he is actually in real life Plato's teacher. Right. But in the book, he's playing a role. Right. And Plato is putting words into his mouth. So these are these are important questions of interpretation. Um, these are going to be central to how we think about the book and what it's doing and the message that it's conveying. OK, so to sum up, we saw that Socrates is arrested again. Um, and we saw that that theme of, of arrest is part of the theme of power in the book as a whole, the power that um, must be exercised to stop the philosopher, the power that must be exercised to make the philosopher rule. Um, and he, Socrates additionally proposes these three huge waves of reform that are supposed to make the just city possible. Um, the first wave, the common activities of women and children, I'm sorry, the, the common activities of men and women, and the second wave, the communism of women and children, um, and the third wave, philosopher's rule. All of these things bring about the, the, the just city in a practical sense. We saw that Socrates uses the metaphor of the body politic to portray the happiness of the city as a whole. And we saw that this metaphor again raises huge questions about what the book is doing as a whole. Right where we've sort of we've seen this difference between the happiness of, of the whole and the happiness of the individual. Right. The city is Socrates is focused on the whole city. 
does that mean that we neglect the happiness of individuals? In this metaphor of the body politic, we have the whole city understood as a single kind of body where everything is related as in sort of limbs or different sort of organs, different parts of the city. And if, if we had a kind of, if that was a sort of sentiment across the city, um, it would be very different to one where everybody has their own private interests and everybody's kind of separated by their private interests and pursues them rather than the interests of the whole. We saw finally, I think, that the some of the outlandish nature of the arguments in this book, book five, force us to raise the question of Plato's intentions. And this requires some work of interpretation. Right. It's not we have to figure out what Plato is saying. He doesn't tell us explicitly. He puts words into the mouth of Socrates, um, his teacher. But when we struggle to figure out what those words mean or, or how to take them, we have to rely on interpretation. Why does Plato present these ideas in this way? Um, what does he want us to take away from them, from the fact that they appear so outlandish, from the fact that they appear the contrary of sort of principles that he's talked about in the book? Um, how are we to kind of understand what's going on? So all of these um, problems will continue to um, continue to occupy us in the next few chapters.